dx is a constant. So if dp dx is a constant, this minus dp dx is simply pressure at inlet minus pressure at outlet divided by x. Right? Or delta p over l, if you're going to write it. So this equation can therefore be written as delta p over l over mu l. R square minus R square. Okay. Let me ask you an interesting question. If you have a pipe coming out here, and if you try to put your thumb over it, you block part of it, what happens to this distance that this travels? Direction. It increases, right? In fact, that's what I frequently use. If I, I try to take my pipe as far as possible, if it doesn't reach where I want it to go, I kind of put my thumb over it. Why does the distance increase if you put the thumb over it? Velocity is increasing. Velocity is increasing. Well, what do you think will happen to the flow rate? Mass flow rate changes. So it's a good question, and the answer is yeah, more likely it doesn't change by much. Why? Because it's incompressible. No, that doesn't mean anything. In, in, in reality, it should decrease by a little bit, yeah. Because it's not a big contributor to the friction? It's not a huge contributor to the friction because your pipe is fairly long. You know? It also depends upon uh, what is the pressure at which liquid is coming out from the pipe, from, from the tap. And, but if you, if you almost completely close it, then of course pressure will build up and the flow rate will go down, right? So yeah, the, the amount of effect will depend upon how, how much you have closed this inlet. All right. Uh, I used to do, I mean, I'm not going to do the problem, but I used to do a very interesting problem in transport, that if you have a pipe that you're holding, how strong do you have to be to hold a pipe that is pushing out liquid that actually uh, goes for fire extinguishing? So to, to, to basically prove why firemen have to be very strong. Because water is rushing in, carrying a lot of momentum. So it drags the lift pipe with it, so you have to be very really strong to hold it. You guys remember that problem? No? Sorry? You forgot? We calculated how strong firemen have to be. But anyway, I'm not going to do that problem. I think that's a, a very interesting problem. Okay, Shh. sorry? No way? I don't remember you doing that problem. I always do. I always do exciting problems, interesting problems. <laughs> Okay, all right, so now this is the velocity profile. What we want to do is calculate flow rate. So flow rate Q, how do you calculate flow rate from the velocity profile? Sorry? You do the differential cross section. Very good, and what is that for a circular pipe? Pi r dr. Okay, very good. So u is a function of r times 2 pi r dr, and integral from 0 to r. Right? That's the flow rate. So you get 2 pi to delta p or 4 mu L. Then you have r squared times r. You integrate that, you get r to the power 4 over 2. Minus r squared times r gives you r cubed. You integrate that, you get r to the power 4 over 4. So the difference between that is simply r to the power 4 to over 4, so you get pi delta p over m r to the power 4 divided by 4 for which is 8 mu l. Right? And that is what is called the, yeah, the Hagen Poise law. And uh, this law, again, if you take my transport course, you should remember, is actually historically very important. Why? Wow. Historically very important because this was the first evidence that no slip boundary condition is a reasonable boundary condition. Because, you know, I asked you the boundary conditions for the pipe surface, and all of you said no slip. Why did you guys say no slip? Is it obvious that there should be no slip? I don't know what teaching means. I think I told you that. <coughs> it's different. I simply teaching.
Meaning would probably mean I proved that somehow. I don't know. But anyway, I just told you. Normally, you never believe this. By the way, I think I also explained to you that's not a fundamental law. In reality, there is a little bit of a split, but not significant split. But when people are trying to figure out through mechanics, the science of Euler, and they didn't know, they didn't know what the appropriate boundary condition is. So Poisson basically used the boundary condition, derived the equation, and verified this experimentally. And that's when people said that uh, the Nusli boundary condition is actually going to be accepted as a reasonable boundary condition. All right, good. So that's our equation for flow rate. Is that only in the laminar flow condition? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's all laminar flow. So we are deriving this today for laminar flow. We'll do that turbulent flow maybe. But turbulent flow, you really cannot derive anything. You just have to assume you know friction factor. Okay. So you have friction factor correlations that you must have seen where friction factor there is some constant. What friction factor for uh, Reynolds, uh, Reynolds, for laminar flow? Reynolds numbers, yeah. So, so yeah, for turbulent flow, it is some Reynolds number to the sub power, power minus 0.2, usually. The constant Reynolds is minus 0.2. But yeah, we will not do turbulent flow today. Okay, great. So that's the expression. So that, therefore, delta P is given by, from that equation, A mu L Q. divided by pi r squared, right? Okay, good. Now, if you have flow rate q to the pi and pressure drop given up by expression, how much work does the pump have to do to push this fluid? Very good, yeah. Somebody has worked their hand raised. The work done is the product of flow rate and delta P. And the reason is, yeah, because work done is force times the displacement, right? Force is basically delta P times the area, right? And displacement, if you think about it, basically in unit time is simply the velocity, right? So A times average velocity, and so you get delta P times Q. Right? All right, so therefore, work done by the pump is A mu L Q squared divided by pi r to the power. Now, the power consumption by the pump is going to be what? Sorry? Except pumps are not 100% efficient, so you divide by the efficiency. Right, so the power consumption is going to be HQL Q squared divided by pi theta. The theta is efficient. Okay, so that's the power. So if you ever need to design a pump for a, for a for a liquid, uh, for a, so let's, let's do some rough calculations here. So let's again look at our previous problem. So let's say that we are say putting, uh, actually if I do the calculation, let me look at optimum solution. Right now let's just have an expression. Okay, so I can erase everything now. So that's all I need to put all to get to that expression. Okay, so that now we have an operating cost. So now we have an operating cost for pumping the fluid. Okay, so that that cost is going to be, of course, this power times some whatever the cost of power is, right? Okay, now the total cost is going to be some cost of power, Cp. Okay. What are, what are the units of CP? Dollars per watt, very good. Times A to UL Q squared divided by 5 theta r squared. Plus the cost of the pipe, right? And the cost of the pipe, you could assume, is going to be proportional to the volume of the metal that is 
energy in you, right? And the thickness of the pipe is going to be basically constant. So the, the cost is basically proportional to the diameter, right? Because the volume of the metal is going to be q pi r times the thickness, right? The volume of volume of metal is going to be q pi r times thickness times x. Right? Yeah? And thickness is more or less constant. L is constant, so you can see the volume of metal is going to be just R. So the cost of pipe is going to be some proportional to these two R. Now it turns out in reality, this is one case where the cost of a pipe is actually proportional to in reality R to power N, where N actually is greater than 1. So pipe is one of the few cases when the, the power cost exponent actually is larger than 1. And the reason is, as you can imagine, vertical towers is another case. And the reason simply is because it's difficult, because it's very difficult to transport really big pipes, right? You need to move them, transport them in, in some place to A to place B, and then take it out, the labor required, everything becomes very complex. So N, N is typically about 1.3, okay? So N is typically 1.3, so now you have C, cost of pipe. So let's say cost of P for pump, so we cannot use P of P, P for cost of pipe. Let's just use P. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Mm -hmm. P2? Mm -hmm. P2. 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 Okay. Very interesting. When I water, you know, when I when I water my garden, I use, I always call it pipe. My last keep telling me it's not pipe, it's coal. That's why it's a pipe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So C V times R to power. Now of course this is the capital cost, this is the operating cost, so what do we do? Sorry? So you can multiply this by R. When R is part of capitalization factor, and what's the value of R? Roughly 0.1 or 1, 1 over 6.7, you know. It will depend upon the rate of, rate of return I and also the life of the process. All right, great. So now we are in good shape. So you can see this curve, of course, goes to R to the power 4, this goes to R to the power 1.3. So clearly there should be an optimum solution. To figure out the optimum solution, of course, you take the derivative of cost with respect to radius, which is equal to zero. So when you do that, you get A mu L Q squared C D over pi theta. What's the derivative of one over R to power four? Negative four, so this becomes thirty-two. Becomes R to power five. Negative, but I will adjust it by just putting it equal to here. Oh, okay, fine. Plus, the derivative on this side will be R. Is it okay if I use this R? I will use it for radius. The capital R is the radius, right? Cp n R to the power n. Okay? So like I told you, n is, n is typically about 1.3. It's equal to zero. And so you can solve for the optimum radius. All right, so we can solve for optimum radius now. So uh, this is 32 mu. L Q square C D divided by five eta times N Power 
wife. Sorry? Okay. And therefore, we have an expression for R. R is going to be 32 Okay. Now, unfortunately, I can't really solve this. I can't really give you an example, at least not right now. I think I have a rough idea of the rest of the numbers, but I have no idea what this Pc would be. Because Pc is cost for less. Actually, it's not cost for length, actually, it's more weird than that, right? Because you also have that, it's not cost for length, it's cost for radius in some sense. So it will always be just, yeah. You can get like, GDP by that, like, by, by the
on a tuition. <laughs> Now everything has changed. Now the ceremony is all fake, short length. They actually talk in words you actually can understand. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> what did you say? What? Why did you say? Somebody said something. No, I, I'm telling you interesting stories. Nobody has anything to say. <laughs> Fire, pure. very good question. What's the significance of fire? Purity. Purifies everything. What? <laughs> oh yeah, in India we burn everybody. <laughs> I want I, I told my wife, I want to be, I don't even want to be burned, I want to be put in that box when you incinerate. But before that, I will give away everything I get. I will be taken to a hospital, take everything you can take from me, and then just put me in the bundle and put me in a box. What? You donated your organs? Can I kill you? Yes, if you have a right next to my home. Okay, all right. So, uh, let's do one more optimization problem, and then I think we can all go home. Which, what should we do? Let's do a heat exchange of a heat transfer problem. So you can see we are doing, if, if nothing else, this hopefully is a good review for you, for I don't know, whatever you have learned in this program, hopefully. Right? At least bits and pieces of it. But, okay. So, uh, what heat exchange problem should we do? We can actually do an interesting one. This is actually a very interesting one. You may have already done this in heat, heat, heat transfer course. Do you know, have you done the, the problem on optimum, or optimum pipe diameter? No. Sorry? No? Okay. So it's actually a very interesting problem. So let's say that you have a pipe. Because all of a sudden it's kind of bound in Oh. So, let's say that this is a pipe carrying some hot liquid, so you're, too, you're, you're protected from losing too much heat, so you put an insulation. Okay? So, the, so the problem actually is called, is called the optimum insulation thickness or optimal, it's a different word for it. So the question is, how much, what should be the insulation thickness? Now what would you get if you increase the insulation thickness what do you think will happen to the rate of heat loss? Decrease. It should decrease, right? Now you see, broadly speaking, that answer is correct, but there is a limiting range of parameters in which that doesn't work. It's the opposite. And that's what makes this problem so more interesting. Now the unfortunate part, unfortunate part that we can be right away is that that parameter range is not relevant to chemical engineering. At least not to the conventional chemical engineering of big pipe, long pipe. So you'll see what I mean by that after I do the problem. <laughs> so, uh, so what we need to do, of course, is you have this pipe, a metal pipe, followed by an insulator, <coughs> and of course there's air. So there's air, there is water, this is metal, this is insulator. Okay? Now, let's say, let's say that this water inside is at temperature T in, and let's say that in this case the flow is turbulent, so the temperature is basically uniform everywhere. So now of course there will be some temperature drop across metal, some temperature drop across insulator, and this is temperature T in. Okay? Now we are going to assume the metal is really very conductive, right? The thermal conductivity of metal is very high. So what would you expect is the temperature of the metal insulator interface? What do you think would be the temperature there? Almost here. Almost here, yeah, TN, right? So we could solve the problem taking metal into account, but you know, we want to go home early, so let's just say <laughs> <laughs> let's just say the temperature is TN. As well. And that's actually a good assumption. I'll kill it. It's not because you want to go home, it's because I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, alright, so now of course you have to solve the problem. The heat transfer problem in this region. 
So again, by now you should barely know the heat transfer equation. Uh, you should barely also know. So the heat conduction problem, what is the solution for temperature profile in Cartesian insulative coordinates? Sorry? A? Huh? A pain. A pain? A pain. A pain. Anybody? What's the solution for heat transfer? Just pure conduction in cylindrical coordinates. Oh, pure conduction. Tn over uh, Tn minus Ta or something like that over. <laughs> I'm just asking. What's the expression for T? Fine. Let's just do it. So del square T equals to zero. Does this seem familiar? Yeah. This is the. The conduction problem reduces to del square t equal to zero and steady state. Here t depends on what? Only radius. Now can you tell me the solution? What? Somebody said something somewhat okay. It's like ln of what? Ln of r. Ln of r. Yeah, we are over here. <laughs> if it was theoretical, it would be. Will be. Somebody said the right answer. What is it? <laughs> so spherical is one over r, cylindrical is log r, and Cartesian is it's linear. Well, no, I would add. Okay, try to derive it. So p is some constant a plus b log r. Now this boundary condition we already said. So let's say this is r equals to r one. Let's say this equals to r two. So temperature at r equals to r1 is Tn. So this can be simplified to A or Tn plus B log R for R1. Right? So we already used the boundary condition, this one. Okay, what do you think is the second boundary condition? That's the uh, um, interface. At r equals to r2. Uh, T of the air. T equals to T of air? Yeah. Very good. So there's something I haven't told you in the problem, the heat transfer coefficient, right? I need to tell you the heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so then what is the boundary condition? The flux. Remember I used to draw arrows. Arrow like this, arrow like this, these two arrows are equal. Yeah. Not the in. Temperature at this boundary, which is T. So, okay, so H times T minus T air is equal to? Negative K dTdr. Very good, excellent. Minus K dTdr. Everything at R equals to R2. Right? The heat that goes to the boundary from conduction leads by convection. Yeah? Seems familiar? A little bit? Good. All right, so now we just have to put everything in. So you get H times T, but T is going to be T in plus B log R, so log R2 over R1 minus Ta equal to minus k dt dr, but dt dr you can see since you're going to be b over r, so minus k b over r2. Right? Yeah? Okay, so therefore we have an expression for p. So therefore p, so B becomes equal to P A minus T N or T A minus T A, let's say. T N minus T A divided by H times log R2 over R1, right? 
plus k over r2. Right? All right, right. So that's our solution. So we have a, we have b, we have our temperature profile. But now, what are we trying to minimize? Heat loss. Very good. So he, what is heat loss? How do we calculate heat loss? <coughs> Very good. So we can either use the conduction equation or convection equation, and give the same answer. It's easier to actually use the you see that conduction equation because if you take the derivative of p, you simply get minus k b over minus k b over r. So p is a plus b of r, right? So minus k d t dr, which is a plus, is simply going to be equal to minus k b <coughs> over r, right? And so we are we are the heat loss is there, so this should be calculated there. R equals to R two. So therefore, what we are trying to minimize is heat loss is going to be minus k b over r times two pi r or pi over r two times two pi r two times n. Right? Because that's the surface area. So that's the flux, that's the surface area, right? Okay. And so, uh, Because it goes to the other side. Okay? And therefore, this expression, this will, this, therefore, this will become flat. Yeah. All right, great, awesome. So now we are in good shape. So now we can write this expression as, also as, so now, of course, we are trying to minimize this, right? All right, let's just say we're trying to look at an optimal solution. So the top, so now we can work with this, but it's much easier in this case. The numerator, does it change with thickness? No. So really it's the denominator. So rather than trying to, we're trying to minimize heat loss, so rather than trying to minimize this, what should we instead do? Maximize the denominator. Maximize the denominator. So let's just work with denominator. Right? So we're going to, so our function f, we're going to define as h times loss of R2, which is let's say R1 plus the thickness, divided by R1, right, plus K over R1 plus K, right? Okay? So now, of course, it's very simple. We just take the derivative, set it equal to zero. So you get h times one over r one plus c 
equal to k or r lambda t squared. Right? Yeah? And and if that's the case, the distribution is going to be r lambda t equal to k of h. 